Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where the plot just continuously thickens, or maybe it continually thickens. I still don't have this grammar thing down. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. And I'll tell you who does have this grammar thing down. William Shakespeare. Or Shakespeare. Or Shake hyphen Spears. Whoever that is, whatever that is, you can't deny the utter brilliance of those plays and those sonnets, and you can't deny that the Shakespeare authorship mystery is one of the more intriguing cultural conundrums that we know of, but our guest this time around takes the authorship mystery and turns it up to 11. His name is Alan Green, and he's worked for the past 15 years trying to solve not only The mystery of who was Shakespeare, but also the mystery of what was Shakespeare. That's resulted in one book with two more on the way and several videos and multimedia presentations available on YouTube. You will come to know a lot about Alan over the course of the next couple hours because this is a bit of a different chat than I've heard from him before. And the Patreon extension for those of you not on there, it's well worth the two bucks or more a month here. It's chock full of good shit, as they say where I'm from. So let's put on our discernment caps, open up our subtle ears, and let the music of the spheres seduce us yet again. And let's welcome Mr. Alan Green into the house. Enjoy. All right, so Alan Green, what a pleasure it is for you to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure, too. Thank you, Ryan. Absolutely. So, you know, we have a lot to get to, but before we get to any of it, we have to tell the listeners who are unfamiliar with you, who you are, you know, a bit about yourself and how you came to be the guy who has apparently decoded William Shakespeare. So tell us a little bit about who Alan Green is, you know, from the beginning. What was your youth like? Were you interested in this sort of occult or esoteric stuff from a young age? Or just tell me how you got here. I was not the least bit interested in Shakespeare my whole life until 15 years ago. In fact, I could say that I was the opposite. I was quite resistant because I had an experience during school age years, early teens, that completely turned me off it. And then only later, as you sometimes realize in life, you go, oh, well, yeah, I'm glad that happened. (laughs) Because now that I'm into this Shakespeare mystery, I have no baggage as to what the official story would have been and what everyone is taught in school, I came to it absolutely clean with a, with no agenda even that, oh, I want to prove this, I want to disprove anything. It was just a, a wide open book to me. So it was a surprise in the first place to even get interested in Shakespeare. But no, it wasn't in my youth at all. In fact, the defining incident that made it absolutely sure that it wouldn't be in my youth was I can remember vividly going to see Merchant of Venice as a school kid, teens. In England, we have this thing called Bonfire Night, Guy Fawkes. You certainly know about Bonfire Night. You know about Guy Fawkes. I do know about Um, Guy Fawkes. So in England, we have this thing where we set off fireworks on November the 5th to celebrate Bonfire Night. And I must tell you that I was always a goody two-shoes kid in school. Never did a thing wrong. I mean, honestly, painfully, I was scared of doing anything wrong. And for whatever reason, this particular night, I saw Merchant of Venice, fell asleep. I was bored to tears and walked out of that theater in Manchester with my school friend going home. And I had a couple of what we call in England bangers. I guess you call them in America I don't know what you call them in America. Sausages? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. about the food? That's bangers and mash. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's what they're talking Sausages. about. <laughs> no. Um, firecrackers. That's it. A firecracker. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. But we call them bangers. But, yeah, we call other things bangers, too. So I've got a couple of bangers in my pocket from November the 5th. This is the first time ever in my life I did anything the least bit uh, outrageous. And I don't know why or where it came from. But I'm with my friend. I go, oh, I've got a couple of bangers. And I light this one and I throw it in the street. Walking home in Manchester, big, big, big city. Within literally 15 to 25 seconds, a cop pulls up on a motorbike 
screeches to a halt, pulls us aside, says, hello, hello, you know, the typical thing, hello, hello, hello. I just saw you throw that venger. Are you aware that it could have landed in the open petrol tank of a passing vehicle and exploded? You could have killed somebody. And I thought, well, that's a bit extreme, but I was terrified. I mean, this is a policeman, you know, and I said, I, 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 I just stuttered. He separates the two of us. My friend, Keith Redway, I even remember his name. He pulls him over. He goes 20 yards away. He looks me in the eye and says, what's your name, son? And I just panicked. I gave a wrong name. I gave a wrong address. And then he was done with me. And he walks back to my friend. He says, uh, what's your friend's name? So it's Alan Green. Where does he live? And he gives my address. <laughs> and I'm busted completely. Comes back to me reads me the riot act, says this is a terrible thing that I've done and I will be charged. And I couldn't believe it. I just, I just threw a firecracker. That's all I did. But I get on the bus to go home. I get home. I walk in the door and on the television is playing Death March in Seoul, which is that dum dum da 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 And I thought, oh, God, they've got it on the news. They already know I've thrown a banger. I was, I, I didn't know. I'm, I'm trying to tell my dad that I've done something that I think is problematic. And he's going, hey, shut up, shut up, shut up. Look at the news. And Kennedy had been shot. So Kennedy was shot that night. It's November 22nd, 1963, when I threw my banger. And I forever have associated that with, oh, Shakespeare, Merchant of Venice, trouble. <laughs> At the worst Christmas of my life, I had to wait for a, we actually went to court in January, magistrate's court. The policeman's there. Yes, that's the young man who threw the banger. It was a, just a, an absolute, it was just crazy. It was Monty Python-ish. But it absolutely <laughs> terrified me, and it, it, it just gave me that thing that, oh, Shakespeare. So that was the inciting incident that made me think, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with Shakespeare ever again. So that was that. I, I put one of my, um, on the list of things for you uh, at the start, themes, karma. Why do I hate Davy Jones of the Monkees? Because mm, yeah. this is from the same time period, isn't it? 63, that was. Kennedy's killed. 66, the monkeys are happening. And when I would come home from school, it was on TV. And it was a, all the rage there in England as it was over here. And I was frankly, really irrationally mad at this guy, David Jones, because he came from Manchester, just around the corner from me. We didn't know each other. But he, he comes from maybe two or three miles away from where I lived. And he'd got this gig. He was the next Beatles. And I wanted to be the next Beatles, as most kids my age, if they were musicians, <laughs> wanted to be. I want that gig. How come he's got it, that little bastard? <laughs> and I was so upset over it, utterly irrational. I hated him. I mean, for no reason other than that he's got this gig that I thought, oh, that'll be That'd be so great to be in a band and blah, 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 blah. I was already playing in jazz groups and stuff, and I was pretty good at piano very, very, very early on. And so it just hit me deeply. And I mention that only because, what, that was 66, so mm, 79, 80, 14, 15 years later, it comes back and bites me with a vengeance. And we'll get to that. But I didn't know him, and I hated his guts. Yeah, people who don't know your story in full yet, we'll tell them why that is pretty uh, karmic later. But, you know, back to the Shakespeare thing in your youth. Let me just give you a little bit about my Shakespeare interest, because I have a question Great. to follow up with that. But I was introduced to Shakespeare early on. I'm talking high school. You know, I guess that's not too early, but that's probably when most people stumble across Shakespeare. You're taught Shakespeare in some sort of class, perhaps. And that's where I came across him. You know, we were reading Romeo and Juliet and uh, King Lear. Hamlet, Macbeth, you know, all those famous yeah. plays. And in my advanced placement English classes, this is where we really got deep into Shakespeare. I think I was probably the only person who was interested in it. The only student <laughs> who enjoyed it. That's not to say that I understood it. That's not to say that, uh, that I found the writing to be particularly interesting especially at the you know as a teenager like at 16 17 years old shakespeare is not that interesting but for some reason alan i found 
myself drawn to the material. I, I tried my best to get through that old English language that I didn't quite understand, you know. But I never did really penetrate that. But I continued to be interested in it on at least the surface level, where I liked the stories from what I understood about them. And that followed me into college, and then I don't think I've read any Shakespeare since I was probably 20 or 21 years old, whenever I had to stop reading it in college. Sure. And it made me think, as I was sorting through your material here, which we will obviously dig into, but it made me think that based on what is there beyond the surface of these stories, is it possible that that this was written in such a style that did sort of deliberately try to turn people away from it, you know, later on, obviously. I'm not saying that, that people went back and rewrote it and changed the language, although I wouldn't put it past anybody, but here in modern times, you know, kids aren't into Shakespeare, and I think that might be, um, the people that are drawn to it are drawn to it probably because of maybe his legacy, but also probably just as many people are drawn to it because of the authorship mystery, right? But I'm wondering if, if yeah. you think that the way that it's taught in high school, where you don't really get any sort of background on, on anything, you don't really try to get into, I guess, the history of the person himself. It's just, hey, here are these old plays written in this old English style. You're a 14-year-old kid. Go have fun with it. Well, not many people are going to have fun with that. Do you think that's um, the way that they sort of push it in curriculums? at these ages, that it is sort of an intentional way to make young people uninterested in the material so they maybe don't seek out the mystery even further? That's a very convoluted question. I'm sorry, but I think you know what I'm trying to say here. No, I don't think that that's a deliberate thing. That would be taking the whole conspiracy too far to say, well, they're deliberately trying to (laughs) keep you off the trail so you don't even investigate it. Let's not make it interesting. Let's face it, it, it's it's very tough language. Anyway, it's 400 years old. The these and thous and dusts, it, it, it all sounds very archaic to us. And so you've got to really get into it and have a good teacher who can convey what those stories are about in order to get past, first of all, the language. Secondly, to your, your question as to whether or not it might possibly have re- been rewritten, That's not possible either because we we do have existent quartos of the plays as they existed then and the what's called the first folio, which came out in 1623, uh, contained 36 plays. So we always go back to that. It's kind of considered sacrosanct. You can't change the language. So no, it's the way it was written and it would have been far better understood back then. There's no deliberate thing to try to make it difficult for for kids or anyone studying it. It just is difficult because of how our language has changed. But it's more difficult and more inaccessible because of the simple fact that, as you said, they don't teach you anything about the person himself. And there's a reason for that, because there is no evidence in that person's life, the person that is that it's attributed to, who I shall call from here on out, Shakespeare, to differentiate from Shakespeare, just so that it's easy to keep track of who I'm talking about. The man born in Stratford on Avon in 1564 was born William Shakespeare, actually Guglielmus, but that's Latin for William. So Guglielmus Shakespeare, and it always had that hard A-K sound. Shakespeare has the soft A. We have no information at all that ties that person's life to playwriting, to poetry, to theatre, except that he was supposedly a part owner in the theatre in London eventually. And there's iffy information that says he was an actor, but there's nothing at all tying him to the writing of the works. So... There is no life to talk about. So when you, you know, you, it's, it's a key part of it. You want to know, well, who wrote this? And how, how were they inspired? And what happened in their life? That, is there anything in their life that ties them to these? Because, because great writers generally write about what they've experienced, what they know themselves. Any writer will tell you that. We write from experience. 
And so that's the reason that it's kind of dull and boring from the get-go is that there's no person to attach it to. And there's this zero paper trail. When I just said, well, the, the quartos and the folio exist, that's the printed material. There are no manuscripts. The original manuscripts that were written for everything, there are none, absolutely zero. So that's the first thing that ties into, wow, what happened to them? Is that unusual for the time? Yes, it's not totally unusual, but it is very unusual that there's none at all. There's, it just doesn't make any sense. Are there any letters? Did the greatest writer in the world ever write a letter to anybody? No. Did anyone write one to him? Only one that was undelivered and un, un, unopened. Somebody w wrote something and that, that exists in the archives. Oh, okay. Is there a poem anywhere? No. Is there a page in his own handwriting? No. Is there a line in his own handwriting? No. Is there a word in his own handwriting? No. Wow. That is very suspicious. <laughs> We have all we have our six signatures that are all spelled differently and that handwriting experts cannot agree were all written even by the same person. And they're on his will, three, and three of them on real estate documents when he was buying various purchases of a home and a couple of things in London. So there's a big, big question mark hanging over that. So that's why you can't teach it. In, you can't teach it with a, any kind of exciting. Oh, there's this, there's that in school because there's no paper trail. You just go straight into the works in a vacuum. So that's what most people experience. That that's what we all experience in in the school version of what we get taught. So then you come to this later, as I did, that there is actually a question. Well, that kind of makes it interesting. <laughs> that that makes it interesting. I would think most uh, kids today would be, oh, cool. You mean there's some mystery? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was getting at, where if my English teacher came in and said, hey, today we're going to read a play from someone who's considered to be the most famous and best writer in the history of the English language, but there's no evidence that this person even existed. If you started off class that way, I am interested. Yeah. I am I'm intrigued. I want to read these stories because now, like you said, there's this element of mystery that's sort of looming in the background of everything. So an astute reader who was apprised of that up front, I think, would read those plays a little differently. They would approach them as clues to, you know, maybe his life or his whereabouts. So Absolutely. that's, I think, what yeah. I was getting at with that question was, is the way that it's taught the way that it's presented is just, hey, here's a story, Shakespeare, you've heard of him, he's good, whatever. But, you know, there's never any sort of detail that goes on with the stories. And the teachers that taught me Shakespeare did not teach it well at that. So, And the other side to that is that there's also, there's tremendous, the other thing that you find out is there's tremendous resistance to even questioning it in academia. And... In England, that's kind of understandable because he's our national treasure and it's a multi-billion dollar tourism industry worldwide, multi, multi, multi-million dollar tourism industry. Don't rock the boat. Stratford itself exists absolutely on the back of come and buy mugs, come and buy t-shirts, come and buy, you know, stay at the the Tempest Motel, and I mean, everything revolves around the Bard. And in a recent poll, they found that uh, they asked all English citizens, British citizens entirely, I think, what, what are they most proud of about their heritage? Is it our parliamentary system? Is it the monarchy? Is it the Beatles? Is it top choice? William Shakespeare. The most the thing that the entire country is most proud of. So if you come in saying, you know, I don't think he was that guy. Whoa, you know, you're dealing with it's almost a, a religious fervor that protects that story, both from those in in the tourism who benefit from it, from those in academia who can only teach what they can teach and have taught all their lives because that's all there is. So it's highly resisted. So you're up against a lot of resistance. And even in America and uh, presumably all over the world, though I haven't researched this in any great depth as to how it's taught throughout the rest of the world, but it, 
essentially, I know in America, certain people's positions are threatened if they begin to talk about the question. Don't talk about the question. So that's very, very interesting that it's certainly something happened. Certainly there is a mystery. It does not mean it wasn't the man from Stratford. It means certainly, though, that there's something happened that he had to keep his identity stumm. And that in itself makes it kind of sexy and interesting. I mean, so, oh, wow, that, tell me about that. So if you could get that out, great. So anyway, I'm not by no means the, <laughs> the, the first or the only person to start bringing this out. But this, this has been for 200 years. The greatest minds in literature have been questioning this. Mark Twain wrote a book called Is Shakespeare Dead? in which he decided to catalog everything we knew about the man. And he writes it down and he says it boils down to five pages, double spaced. That's what we know about him. 72 facts none of which have anything to do with playwriting or poetry. We know that he hoarded grain during a famine so that he could gouge the price of it for his fellow citizens in Stratford and then went back to London and wrote, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a bastard in real life. He's suing his neighbours for pennies here and there and there, and then back in London, he's magnanimous and, you know, writing this wonderful stuff. So there's a big gulf between the written works and what we can possibly know about his life. So in I Jump anyway, I mean, I'm, I guess say hundreds, possibly even, I mean, if you look at the figures, there are supposedly well over 4,000 books and articles have been written about the mystery itself. If you look at the number of books that have written about Shakespeare, it is mind boggling. The Birmingham Public Library, Shakespeare Library in England, decided they wanted to get together all the books that had ever been written about Shakespeare. Let's collect them all and put them all in one place. And we'll call it the Birmingham Shakespeare Library. And in one of my presentations, I give a, a picture of this because it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean a lot to us when you say 37,000 books, individual books. But when you see it, so I put together a presentation where I show you what 37,000 books looks like. This is not 37,000 books with 10 of the same book there and 20 of the same book there. Individual, unique titles. And it looks, it, it looks incomprehensible. But that 37,000 books that they collected, they stopped collecting at that point because they had no more room in the library. And that was in 1949 that they stopped counting. There are <laughs> well over 100,000 unique titles about the man Shakespeare that all say he must have done, and he no doubt was here, and presumably he blah, 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 and almost certainly he must have all the conjecture because we have no facts at all. Mark Twain said we've got five bones and 37 barrels of plaster of Paris to make this brontosaurus skeleton known as William Shakespeare. That's all we've got. So, so when you start in school like that, I think, yeah, wow, tell me about this. Because if you could find the person it really is, or find at least the truth of the story as to why there's a cover up, well, then it becomes a hunt, then it becomes a challenge, and it becomes something really cool. And so that's how I got into it. A friend of mine, Michael Dunn, 15 years ago almost, asked me to come and support him doing a show in Los Angeles. He was doing a one-man show called Sherlock Holmes Solves the Shakespeare Mystery, in which he plays Sherlock Holmes back from the dead to tell you in his own inimitable way that he, is, he has examined all the evidence and he's discovered that it cannot be the man from Stratford and it must be, ta-da, and he says, it's this person, the uh, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. And that movement that believes it's him is called the Oxfordian movement because of his name Oxford. There are others who believe it's Bacon and they're called Baconians. There are others who believe it's Marlowe and they're called Marlovians. And there are others who believe it's all kinds of different combinations. And the, for sake of as we talk about this, the people who think it's the man from Stratford are called Stratfordians. So that's the playing field. Stratfordians versus all these various other categories because there's a mystery and we don't know who, who it really is or why there is a mystery.
So I get invited anyway to his talk. And I really don't want to go because of what? Because of this experience I had as a kid that blocked off Shakespeare for me. I don't want to go and get in trouble with the police. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want the president to be, uh, well, well, let's not go there right now. I don't want, I don't want, <laughs> I didn't say that. I don't want another po political assassination to haunt me because I fell asleep during Merchant of Venice. So, I mean, it was just, oh, man, I don't really want to go, but you're my friend. And, of course, I went expecting to be bored to tears, but he brought out all of this story that I've briefly brought to you. Not on the codes, but he, he was just telling you there's this mystery, there's no paper trail, and in great detail he lays it out and says, you know, something happened. It may not be the guy that we've all been taught that it is. But then he he lays out the hypothesis that it is Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. And that got me into it. And from the next day onward, I started to write a musical because that's what I do. And essentially, I was off and running. And I haven't had a day off since. Yeah. And, you know, before we get into that, let's tie up your timeline because we dropped that karmic reference to Davy Jones and the Monkees several minutes ago. Let's tie up that part of your life and then let's move into the, the more present period. So how does karma come back and bite you in the ass in 1980-ish? Yeah, I can't jump straight to that, but I, I can give you a, a very fast tour of how I got there, which I call my manifesting spree. And I I like to do this only to show how it happens for people that they might get to where where I was at. I know many people in this in the same boat who have had experiences like this. You kind of read a bit here and a bit there about how you can make, you know, thought is a thing and you can make your destiny happen and I was very interested in that, and I, at a very young age, started to think, yeah, God, that makes sense to me. I didn't know how to meditate, per se, but I knew how to sit in front of a picture and say, I can imagine that this is real. And so for me, the start of that was I wanted, after having been through my musical training, classically trained for nine years in piano, I go to the... Northern School of Music and Royal College of Music end up, it's not for me, it's too restrictive. And I go to Africa with a jazz band and I've got the travel bug. And now I, I just want to go out into the world and play my music. I love jazz. I love, I was beginning to get into writing, although I was, I was atrocious, absolutely atrocious at writing my own stuff at that time. But nevertheless, I wanted to go out into the world. And for whatever reason, I was playing in a jazz club in, in a, a city in England, Coventry. And I just got this idea, oh, it'd be great to be on a cruise ship. Cru I hear there are gigs. You can, get a, you can be a pianist on a cruise ship and sailing around the world. And I imagined all the things that you think of as a young kid. You know, I'm, I'm 19. Oh, I'm going to be seeing all these countries all over the world. And I'm, of course, going to have romantic interludes every single night throughout the entire my life on this ship. So I got a picture of a cruise ship, stuck it up on my wall, sat there, looked at it, imagined myself on that cruise ship, could see it, smell it, taste it, saw myself playing the piano, being popular. And I just did this every night, thinking that's how you make it happen. And within about three months, I got a call out of the blue from a, someone I did not know, who calls me up and says, I hear you're a pretty good piano player. You play at such and such club. Yeah. He says, I got a gig on a cruise ship. Would you like to go? I mean, no contact. I had, I, it wasn't as though I went looking for it, except in my own <laughs> imagination. Just, he just, I didn't know the person. He says, my, my pianist just died. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other thing. I thought, oh, huh. I, I was somebody's death. <laughs> <to buy. laughs> oh, okay. He says, my guy just died and we're, we're going off next week. Uh, I need a pianist badly. And that's how I came to uh, get to go and, and fulfill that thing. And I thought, oh, that's how you manifest. Great. So I went out to the Bahamas and I was 21 years old. And I started to do that in everything, thinking, all right, next I want to do and I won't go into the whole list, but I did a ton of things where I want this, I want that. I would sit in front of a picture of it, imagine it, and it would happen. So apparently I'd got the right, you know, I, I was able to concentrate enough to pull this together. 
let's just say for want of speeding this along that I, I, I started to want a record deal. And I imagine myself signing a record contract. And sure enough, then I'm there signing a record contract in, in London, back in London. And that kind of fell through because they would have these what they called image meetings. They'd, they'd have me come down from Manchester to London to say, uh, your name is, well, my name is Alan Green. No, your name is, and they'd, they'd say, we want to call you Tommy Blue. And now I'm going to tell you, this is absolutely true. Your name is Tommy Blue. And guess what? And they would, in a, in a kind of um, uh, sotto voce, say, you always wear blue. <laughs> Get it? Even on the radio. And I thought, what? What are you? Are you guys serious? And they went out and bought me a, a wardrobe of everything blue. Everything's blue. And then the next month they'd have another image meeting. No, your name is not. Forget that. Your name is now Tommy Rainbow. And I'm not making that up. As awful as that is, I was given the name Tom Rainbow. And then I was given the name Mad Jack. Mad Jack. Sounds a bit like magic. Get it? And you're kind of a mad kind of guy. Mad Jack. And every month they would have these image meetings. Come on in for an image meeting. I got so fed up of this that the final one, I went in and dressed in a full suit of armor. Chainmail. Armor, a mace, a visor, a plumed feather in my <laughs> helmet. And I walked into the meeting and said, my name is Alan Armour. And guess <laughs> what? I always wear armor, even <laughs> on the radio. And they thought that I wasn't taking their image meeting seriously, and they dropped me. Now. I go from there to, all right, well, that's fine, because that's just a tiny label. I want a big label, and I start deciding I'm going to manifest Clive Davis. And I am sitting in my room in London, looking towards New York, across the Thames, thinking, well, his office must be about there. And I'm imagining signing a record deal with Clive Davis of Arista Records. I actually go into his office in New York wearing a scuba diving outfit, scare the hell out of everybody, but I get attention. You know, you've got to draw attention in this business. You've got to be more than the music. You've got to be, look at me, look at me. Well, he signs me. He signs me and he sits me down at the piano and he says, well, he signed me after seeing me do a show, admittedly. My uh, manager got together a show and we, we did a show in London and Clive Davis was there and he signed me. But he gets me in a meeting and he says, you know, uh, you haven't written any hits. I've heard your demos. I mean, I signed you. You've got, you know, you've got chutzpah and blah, blah, blah. I think you're going to do well, but you haven't written any hits. I need a hit. I'm the guy known for having the, the ears. I can hear the hits, right? And I was so pissed. I went home back to England and demoed three songs that weekend and sent them in saying, hey, there you go. There's your hits. And one of them was a joke, and it was called 15. And it was, um, it went something like, well, not something like it went exactly like the chorus went, b -b -b baby, you'll soon be 15. And you know what I mean when I say I love you, I love you. 15. It's a joke. Legal age. 16. Get it? But no, Clive Davis didn't get it. He goes, that's it. That's a hit. You're going to record it. And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It was a joke. I didn't mean it. And I recorded it under duress. And we had a fabulous recording of it. But still, I thought, I can't be singing this. I'm 25 years old. I can't be singing teeny bopper songs to 15-year-old girls. What if it is a hit? That will be my persona for the rest of my career, which will last exactly a year. So I actually turned him down. He'd put a ton of money, I don't know, probably close to almost a million at that time into a, a freaking album. We did an entire album. And he's insisting, yep, that's your, that's your single. I said, no, 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 I did that. I, give it to somebody else. Give it to the Bay City Rollers. Give it to some boy band. That's fine, but it's not me. I can't sing that. And I refused to release it, and he dropped me. So there I've manifested <laughs> a deal, and my own attitude – has lost me the deal. And now from then on, I, I, I'm thinking, well, this is just ridiculous. I've got to, I can, I can manifest this stuff, but I don't seem to be able to keep a hold of it. 
I've been dropped from one for wearing a <laughs> suit of armor. I've been dropped from another for refusing to let Clive Davis put out the record he wants to put out. So this went on for some time. The only reason that I'm telling all this to, to your listeners is because it was important for me to get to see the, the huge ego that was attached to all that effort. Me, me, me. I can do this. I can make this happen. That's where I was at. I certainly was a pain in the ass to work with. And I, I had all this absolute strong willpower to make things happen. But it was, it was not a good place to be. And eventually, after, there's a lot of, I, I, I'll pass by a lot of these other things because it's just the same thing over and over and over again. Gate crashing parties, trying to tell Elton he's got to sign me to, to his label, trying to tell Richard Perry he's got to sign me to his label. On and on and on, I felt as though I was destined to have something happen. And I wanted very, very much for this ego thing to be satisfied of having a hit record. I wanted recognition. You know, I mean, it's that it's as basic as that. And yet I wasn't giving a thought to where it's coming from. Not a thought. And after getting myself into terrible, terrible state of, of all of a sudden, it seemed I couldn't manifest anymore. I came to L.A. I pitched to 20 or so record labels all of which said, yeah, fabulous, we're interested, and then the phone never rang. Yes, we're interested, no, we're not. Yes, we're interested, no, we're not. Happens to a lot of people. But I was at the end of my tether and driving in a rented car on an American Express car that had finally been caught up to me. I had no more money left. I was deeply in debt, and I was driving out to a friend to, to just – party for the weekend and say, I can't stand this anymore. I think I'm going to go to debtor's prison. We have a thing called debtor's prison in England. I just, I couldn't manifest. After having all this willpower to manifest, 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 all of a sudden I couldn't. And I'm driving back thinking, what, what is going on here? And I started to, to, in my mind, but not really truly saying to God, you know, because I wasn't a religious person. But I felt as though, well, that's the way to connect with this power. I think it must be God, although I don't have a religion. And I'm starting to say, well, why, why have you brought me this far? Why have you given me this, this ability to, to, to manifest these things if now all of a sudden I can't manifest a single thing and I don't have that record deal and I don't have what I thought was coming to me? And anyway, to cut that long story short, I had an experience in the desert driving back where it was clear that, call it what you will, because I don't want to offend anyone about whatever their thoughts are about religion, I just call it a spiritual experience, where I was talking to a power, a divine power, and saying, I'm lost, I can't do this anymore, I thought it was all me. And the response that I got was, yeah, that's the point, you thought it was all you. Have you ever given a thought to where all this ability or this talent or this willpower or this manifesting is actually coming from? And I had to say, no, not really. And I had an experience that, that changed my life where it was as though a hand had been drawn across the entire horizon as I'm driving and said, well, I'm doing this all the time and nobody pays any attention. And everything changed. Everything changed visibly. It's as though I could see the sap in the trees and the atom in everything. And I, it, was, it was an experience that people often talk about as being an awakening experience. But it changed my consciousness completely. And I was thrown into an experience of what I can only describe as bliss where I was in the deepest, most perfect peace I had ever encountered or even imagined could possibly exist. I was completely secure, blissfully happy, <laughs> even though I was monstrously in debt and thinking that I was heading back to nothing. I had nothing. 
And at that moment, I knew that the secret about this manifesting was to acknowledge where it is coming from. And the reason I've put, I've put a visual aid out for, for people if they, I don't know if you sent that out or mentioned it to your listeners, but can I mention it now just to say that, because there'll be things that you'll want to see yeah. pictures of uh, anyway. There's a PDF on my website which is www.tobeornottobe.org. And then if you go to that website, and there's no numbers in that, that is just the way Shakespeare would have written it, right? Tobeornottobe.org. There's a tab that you will see called podcasts. And if you go to that tab podcast, you can just download a PDF and it will give you some visuals because my work is very, very visual and it will help as we get into the codes, Shakespeare's codes, to be able to see that. And so that's for those who are listening, you know, they can at least have something to look at. In that PDF, the first thing that I show is an image that came to me at that time, and it's a circle with some numbers on it. So when you're looking at it, you'll see a circle with 100% at the top and 0% at the bottom. And that is talking about how positive are can you think and how negatively do you think? Because what I had been doing at that time was I was aware that if I sat to, I didn't know how to meditate, but if, if I sat and looked at that picture of that cruise ship or looked in my mind's eye at a picture of me signing a contract with Clive Davis, things that you'd say, well, that's not possible. But I was so convinced it was possible that I would churn the ether with that thought. So if you decide, and many, many philosophies will tell you that you can do this, right? You can sit and you can manifest by saying, I see it. And the key thing is always believing it's already happened. It's not just I hope that for this, but I'm actually seeing it as though it already is. And of course, what happens is we say, let's say you have a goal. I want X. I see X. It has happened. It is my life. Here I am living X, whatever is your goal. If you do that and you pour out all this energy for maybe half an hour, you know, as I used to do, and then you come away thinking, all right, I'm done. I've got it. I feel as though it's real and the phone will ring. I know it will ring eventually with that, <laughs> that goal. But what happens? Our mind then also chimes in with, who the hell do you think you are? Are you kidding me? That can't happen, doesn't it? I mean, we all experience this. We can, no matter how positive we decide to be, there's the other side that goes, our upbringing from whatever, parents, friends, people who don't want you to succeed. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's never going to happen. Who are you kidding? So we have this thing going on all the time, a certain amount of positivity and a certain amount of negativity. At that experience in the desert, I could see absolutely clearly that I had been using that without knowing what it was. I was churning, churning, churning. And if I could churn that ether so that I could get up to, say, on this picture, 75% positivity and only 25% negativity, say, at the end of the day, watching your thoughts, being vigilant, you would end up um, on this diagonal that if you then drop a vertical line from that 75 percent you have to be looking at this picture now to get this so you know for those who are listening tune into that and have a look at the picture it will drop a line down to this horizontal that is a timeline and it just made sense to me that oh that means i would manifest that goal that i'm wanting in a certain amount of time and it will be along this line over there if i'm thinking 50 50 all the time Unwittingly, I can, char I can charge at it with all this positivity all for half an hour, but then the rest of the day I'm going, no, it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. The mind is sending out as much positive thought as it is sending out negative thought, and at the end of the day, you'll be where? You'll be 50-50, and that line drops down at the end on the circumference of your circle, which I intuitively understood meant never. It's never going to come to you because you're attracting it, you're repelling it, you're attracting it, you're repelling it. There must be a science to this. That's what the experience to me 
meant when I was given a vision of this particular image that said, try to be up there in 90% because then you're going to manifest your goal far sooner, maybe a month from now. All right. But what happened to me in that desert was this mysterious thing that if you look to the top of that circle, what does 100% mean? 100% means you drop a line down from 100% and it means you manifest now. Wow. <laughs> Is that possible? Yeah, why not? Yeah, but it's so, but it is not just a sort of, oh, I'm 100% positive. It means that all those little negative voices that are part of our psyche that we deal with all day long, you can't do that. Oh, what if? Uh, I don't think, hmm, maybe using the word if, if it happens, that has to go. Well, when I was talking to the divine and I knew at the time, this was divinity. And that divine voice was saying, essentially, do you think, well, first of all, it said, those 20 record labels that you just tried to turn on, where in the past you could manifest anything you wanted, but you've come to LA and you've tried to get 20 labels and they've all just shut down. None of them have called you back, right? Who do you think turned off, off all those ears? Mm, maybe you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Okay. And do you think that the being or the force or the energy or the divine or call me what you want, but you think the I am that I am that creates the entire universe that is showing you, and I'm looking at a, a universe that has changed to my visual sight because it's literally nothing like I'm seeing power, I'm seeing energy everywhere. You think the being that makes all this happen can't get you a record deal? Oh, <laughs> hmm. ask me. Don't sit there saying, I am doing it. I am doing it. Ask me. Wow. It was a bit, it was a, it was a life changer. And at that point, I just said, well, I, I, I give up anyway. I give up. I surrender because I was at my rope's end. And that happens to a lot of people. It happens to a lot of us. We have to see, we hear that. Oh, you've got to hit rock bottom before you can bounce back up and have, ah, I get it now. Well, that was my rock bottom. I was owing a tremendous amount of money and I needed a tremendous amount of money and I needed a record deal. And I didn't know where I was going from here because my past manifesting was apparently not working. And now a divine assuredness is coming to me saying, just surrender and let me do it because obviously I can do it. I just want you to recognize where it's coming from. And in that moment, I did. And in, in, in surrendering, all the negative thoughts were gone completely. But I mean completely. I actually was trying to find a negative thought, delving deep into my mind. I was actually trying to think a negative trying to think, yeah, but what if this is in my imagination? It, it was gone. And so in other words, at that point, I was clearly on this image that is in that PDF. I was at 100%. And that line drop for now from 100% says now. It is manifested now because you believe utterly 100% and there's no possibility of even a tiny flicker of doubt. Because you're asking the divine to do it, not yourself. And the divine, or whatever you want to call this power, can do it. And maybe there are times when you can't. So that was the experience. I, then I literally, it, it just went into, so what do you want? What do you need? And I'm going, well, you know what I did. What are you talking about? What do I want? I, you know how much in debt I am. I need a fab. I need an enormous amount of money. And this, don't forget, this is uh, 40 years ago. So when I say I needed 60 grand, 60 grand back then was, I don't know what it is now, but it was, not, it was probably four or five times that, you know. It was a lot of money that I needed. But I knew, here's the beauty of it, I knew I could ask for a million at that moment. And in 100% positivity, I would have a million dollars. But I also have this sense of, you don't need to ask for that. Ask for what you actually need. Because this will always be here, this consciousness, if it stays, will always be here. So you can ask for what you need again when you need it. Don't be greedy. Just say, well, I need this. And that's what I said. I need $60,000 to get 
out of debt and to have enough money to write about this experience and get my record deal and, and thank you. Fine, you've got it. Now let's talk about something else. And I'm driving back to L.A. with this absolute assuredness. It's fixed. It's done. I didn't understand. I'm driving back and I'm looking at bank and I didn't know what it meant. Bank? Why would you need a bank? I'm looking at insurance company and I don't know what it means. All my friend, friends thought I was on acid permanently. They just thought, oh, well, you've, you've, you've just blown it. You've just, you're Alan, you've gone too far now. <laughs> but that's the state I was in. And, I, and it, I was in that bliss for about three and a half months. It would not go away. I get back to LA, the phone rings, and it's Richard Perry of, Rock, of Planet Records, whose home I had broken into a month previously to give him a demo. Seriously, broken into his home in Beverly Hills. He was not pleased. But I was that desperate. Please listen to this music. It's fabulous. I'm good. I was signed by Clive Davis. I promise. It's great. I, I love your stuff. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm sorry. Uh, I love your album with Nielsen. Harry, the Nielsen album. I love it. And blah. He was Richard Perry. He was a great record producer, right? Blah, blah, blah. No, get out of here. I get <laughs> back to L.A. and the phone rings. It's Richard Perry. He says, two days ago, on that Saturday that I was driving through the desert, the moment, the now on this graph, I, I listened to that tape. It's great stuff. Will you come to my home? You know where I live. And I go to Richard Perry's home. I don't sign with him, but I get a record deal. And of course, how much, how much do they give me for the record deal? I'm going to say 60,000. On the nail. Great. So now I, I preface all of that by saying that for your listeners, because I want to pass that along. It's a, a an actual usable diagram of where you can grasp how this manifesting works. If I'm thinking 50% positive and 50% negative is never going to come. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be bringing it up to 60, 70, 80. Can I get it to 90 with sheer willpower? Yes. Can you get it to that position of grace? And it is because it's not a normal state of mind to be in, 100%, no negative thoughts anywhere. I go to sleep, I wake up, it's still there. I can't shake it. I don't want to shake it. It's bliss to where everybody thinks you're stoned permanently. <laughs> and I, was, I wasn't. I was just, uh, oh, wow. But then it faded away, and in three months it was gone and I knew that that meant now you've got to find out how you can get that yourself. And that takes me into the second and third part of, of this story, which now it gets interesting as to how the, and that dovetails into the Shakespeare. But I wanted to tell that not to, not to blow my own trumpet and say, look, I was this great manifester. No, the, to, to get you the sense of, wow, I think all of us at some point, Many of us certainly get that feeling of, yes, I can manifest. And we see it in people like the Richard Bransons of the world and the Elon Musks of the world who are just manifesting. Next, next, next great thing, next great thing, because they're used to it. They're used to manifesting with sheer power of will and thought. But there is a place and maybe, you know, it's only for certain people who they, they, they can't they suddenly hit that wall. You can't start. You can't be manifesting anymore. Because I need you to understand where it's coming from. So maybe it's not the same for everyone. I'm sure it's not. But for me, it was, oh, boy, you better shape up, man, because you're in deep trouble if you don't acknowledge where this is coming from. And I wrote the song, I Surrender, which is seemingly on the externally a love song. It's on the, on the website, but it's not. There's a line in that says, then like that, in the middle of the night, the guru thumbed a ride and said, of, I got a woman for you. And that woman was, in Vedic philosophy, the divine mother of the universe. And that's what made sense to me, thinking of God as a divine loving mother who takes care of you and says, oh, you're OK. Just let me do it. I'll, it'll be all right. <laughs> And so that song, and then I got my hit record. I was given the hit record, it was, but it was only a small one. It was a little tiny top 30 thing, and then it was done because, again, I had to, it was not for me to have that fame, 
how I experienced the fame that I wanted to have all my youth and all my younger days was, I wish I was as famous as that bastard from Manchester, Davy Jones. That's the gig I wanted. So what happens? As soon as I've found now, I've got my 60 grand. I'm okay. I can write. I've got a record deal. I put the record out. It's a hit, small hit. I get a call. And his, I personally think this is just so funny because this is, how, this is how karma works. I hate the bastard when I'm a teenager. I'm watching him on TV. Why has he got this gig? That should be my gig. Don't know him, but he's a little guy from around the corner in Manchester. I'm from Manchester. Okay, and now years and years and years and years later, I've got my little tiny hit. It's okay. You've experienced it. You really want the big deal. Apparently not going to come. It's not for you. And I get a call, and this call comes after I am having such a wonderful time because now I've found my own path. I found meditation. I found real meditation. I know how to meditate now. I've got a technique, and I'm practicing it every day. At this time, I'm talking about 40 years ago. And I'm sitting meditating, and I'm in bliss. I found that bliss again, the bliss that disappeared. But I found a particular path, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not evangelizing. I'm not going to say what it is, you know, because we all have to find our own path. And it's not that one path works for everybody. It's just find what resonates for you. But I found what was right for me, and I'm meditating. And I'm, in, I'm going, oh, this is all I want. I'm sitting, I'm doing meditation four hours a day. And I'm in that bliss again, because that's all, you, all the soul really wants. Once it finds it, it's just, oh, ah, no negativity. I'm in the Divine Mother's arms all the time, walking around like I'm high, but I am high. I'm the, what, the, why do they call it the most high? Yeah. <laughs> the most high. So I write to uh, this particular uh, meditation center saying I want to be a monk. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a letter back saying, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Just keep on doing what you're doing, you know. But so because I really wouldn't accept me as a monk, I made a vow. And here's where it gets juicy. I vowed celibacy and I vowed sobriety because up until then, neither of those were on my list. <laughs> I got a shape up. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I'm smoking, I'm drinking, I'm screwing around. And I vowed a serious vow. Thank you for everything that you've given me. Thank you for this bliss. I vow I will do that. Not because you have to, but because I just I personally wanted to. I felt it would be good for me at that time. I'm going to vow that. I'm going to stick with that because that will conserve my energy. And I've had my little hit and I'm kind of satisfied. It's OK. Two days later, the phone rings a gig. We want you to come and whip this band into shape. They can't read the charts properly. Just You're just going to rehearse them and go to this theater, and that's all it is. And they, they can't read charts, but you can get them into shape. They have to go on the road in a couple of days. Boom. I go. I'm whipping the band into shape. It's true. They can't read music. I can read music. There's the charts. I'm teaching them the songs. And every fourth song is a monkey's song. I'm going, what's this? You know, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then, oh, last train to Clarksville. This and this and this and this and this. Oh, I'm a believer. This one. And I'm going, what is this? No one will tell me. And then I look, they, the doors open 200 yards away out down the alleyways of this huge theater. Doors open and in walks that bastard from Manchester. And my stomach churned from feeling bliss <laughs> and being happy with life everything's cool everything's just fine i can take it or leave it something good happens great something bad happens eh, no big deal in walks david jones and all that hatred came back from my teen years of this is the guy i hate and he walks up to me and he goes Hello, cowboy. I hear you're from Manchester. Oh, great. Do you know that, uh, you know that pub around the corner in Sale? Sale, uh, what's it called? Oh, the Crown. Have you ever been down there? Do you know where the Sharples, the woman on the t that team? And he starts in about all kinds of Manchester humour. And, of course, I kind of respond with Manchester humour. 
And within five minutes, we're telling each other jokes that only we understand because it's absolute thick Manchester. Hey, bloody hell, that guy felt down road. <laughs> and we're joking like this. And nobody understands. This is the American band is standing on stage going, what the hell's happening here? What's this? And he and I are getting along like a house on fire. And I realized I love this guy. And I'm making him laugh. Genuinely, he's laughing himself silly and he's making me laugh. And genuinely, I have to tell you, he was the funniest person I've ever, ever known on the planet. He could make you ache, hurt from laughing. And as soon as he got you laughing, he would, he would keep on poking away. And he'd go on and on and on until you beg. He said, no, shut up. I can't stand it. Are you killing that My stomach's hurting. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> he was that funny. And he's making me piss myself laughing. And he's laughing. And he just turns to me and says, oh, come on. You're coming on the road, aren't you? You're coming on the road with us because I've I, I got to have an Englishman. I've got to have a Manchester guy with me. We, we'll be great. I can't talk to these yanks. And I just said, yeah. Two days later, I'm his musical director on the road with the band, partying every night, <laughs> right? He's Davy Jones. He's getting offers from all the fans constantly. And he and I have to have adjoining rooms because I'm the musical director and I have to be able to go into his room to say, you know, tonight I think we'll, we'll cut out these eight bars and go from this to that song and let's put this song here. And he's there with his girlfriends for the evening. And he's always coming to me. You're going to help me with these ladies or are you going to? And what he called meditation was he would he would do this with his hands. You have to imagine. Sit, like you can see me on the sky. But those of you who are listening, just put your hands on your, you know, that classic pose of putting your upturned hands in meditation posture. He would turn to me and say, you're going to. Um, what is it you do when you meditate? He says, well, because I'm meditating all the time on the bus and on the road. And I vowed. Right. I have vowed what? celibacy, sobriety. I'm going to ship up and I'm on this road with the biggest sex symbol star of the 60s. It's now just 1980, but he's still doing his thing. And I don't fit in because I'm, I've made this vow and I'm going to stay with that vow. God, half a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, you're vowing that, are you? Okay, well, how can you, how about handling this? And two days later, I'll have David Jones call you <laughs> and I'll and I'll have you find that that weird thing that you had about hating him is not hate. It's actually you love him. Uh, you must have a connection from some past life thing because obviously it's bloody strong. And we've got to work together now to sort that out. And now I'm on the road with him. For the next 12 years, I'm on the road with him. I lasted two years with my vow. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> I broke yeah. it after two years. <laughs> But the thing was that, you know, it was just and he would look at me meditating and he'd say, what is it you're doing? I mean, well, why don't you want to party with us? I mean, is that better than what we're doing? I mean, well, and he called it why me? It. He said he'd sit with his hands like this and go, what do you do? Do you go, why me, Lord? Why me? Looking <laughs> with his hands up turned, And I'd say, well, it's, it's a meditation technique. So every night he'd come to me. Are you going to help me with these ladies here or are you going to why me it? And I'd say, no, I'm going to wind me it tonight. Oh, okay. All right. And that went on for two years. Love the man dearly. Rest in peace. That was a wonderful life changer. But it only prepared me for what was coming, which was because in that time, I end up doing two books for David. They made a monkey out of me and Mutant Monkeys, both of which were award-winning books. And to do them, I had to learn how to do them through desktop publishing. I created them entirely uh, on the Macintosh computer. In fact, the Mac only came out in 84. I got my first Mac in 85, and now he's, he's doing the Monkeys reunion tours in 87. We got a book out that's a bestseller, huge, that has been created, and it was teaching me how to do all the visuals that I now use to promote Shakespeare, <laughs> who, who I also hated, if you remember, um, yep. because, because it's comic. And you, this is my job. This is clearly what I came here to do. I had my little hit. That's done. Get out of the music business now. It's too dangerous for you. You'll die if you stay in the music business. And let's just get serious. And so finally, my friend Michael uh, invites me to the Shakespeare thing. And I know, oh, this now I can do this. 
And the other thing about that is that now I'm not, you know, in the past it was manifesting for me. I'm promoting myself. I'm damn good. Sign me. Look, at here's my demo. Sign me. I broke into your house, I know, but sign me. <laughs> I'm wearing a scuba diving outfit, I know, but sign me. <laughs> it's all about me. And this isn't, this is about finally saying, I want to put the crown on the head, on the right head of whoever it was that gave us these great, great, amazing works of literature and poetry that I don't fully understand because of the language, but nevertheless, there's a deeper story going on. So my job, my what I clearly feel is what I've been doing for the past almost 15 years now, 14 years I'm, I'm counting, is to solve this mystery of who the person is who wrote the greatest works of Western literature because he's left actual codes for us. And so everything that came before was just preparation for that. So there you go. Yeah, and I thought that is such an interesting journey that you've taken to this point. We've covered pretty much your entire life there. And you mentioned in your notes to me that, and you just touched on this too in, in what you were saying, that that first part of your life was about self-promotion. You were you were so concerned about your own career and your own work and, and yourself. And then this theme for the last 15 years has been no self-promotion, like you just said. You, you are trying to do something, like you said, put the right crown on the right head. I forget how you phrase that. But that's what you're trying to do here with this Shakespeare mystery. So you don't feel like what you've done to this point the last 15 years is, has any sort of did you manifest this at all? Is is this part of your manifestation background? Like, did you somehow bring this into being to be one of the guys leading the uh, the decoding effort of, of who Shakespeare really was? That's a really good question, Ryan. Uh, no one's asked me that, and 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 I I can't honestly say that I know the answer. I would say clearly yes, but not consciously. In other words, everything that, if you believe as I do, and this is a very hard concept, so I'm not going to dwell on it because, of course, the world looks like a mess. It just looks like a mess. And there are tragedies, and, and it's, it's all too trite to say, oh, it's perfect, it's perfect. You know, that's just terrible. Try telling that to someone that's going through tragedy or has lost a loved one. And I've certainly been there, and I know but my, my faith in what has happened to me through all these experiences tells me that even if I cannot see the perfection, if you accept the simple, almost mathematical premise that there's a creation, right? I think we can all accept that. We're in a creation. Did I make this creation? I certainly don't remember. <laughs> and yet all the great spiritual truths and paths point to an expression, the name of God being I am that I am, or the great I am. Name of God given to Moses on Mount Sinai by God. He says, and that is translated, I am that I am. Consciousness, it is so extrapolating from that, the creation is made presumably by a creator. I know we could get into an argument about that, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but whatever feels right for you. For me, that makes sense. It's been created. Did it just create itself out of nothing? I don't believe so. I believe it is a conscious creation. And if that's the case, if it's some supreme being that one must assume is responsible and knows everything, omnipotent, omniscient, is one of the definitions in many of the Vedic philosophies, then you're left to conclude that that, that being is, is utter perfection and is perfect on some level. And if that's the case, one has to just try to navigate the daily tragedies that we all experience, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and go, all right, uh, I don't understand it, but I, do, I must have faith because my inner being, my inner bliss tells me there is absolute perfection when you look down at the mathematical, at the scientific, at the 
atomic structure level. You know, forget the drama out here. But look, we all do know, we know science is coming to this conclusion today that no matter with the had Large Hadron Collider and all of our technology, we're going to find the God particle, are we? Is it the Higgs boson? Is it, I, well, more and more scientists are saying, no, I fear that we will never find that it is somehow a mysterious entity that calls to us, but we're not going to find it that way. Yeah, some believe they will. So, yeah, you asked, <laughs> did I manifest <laughs> this 15 years of work? I feel as though I just volunteered for the job when it was presented to me, but I have to accept that, yeah, probably prior to this life, I, I was involved in plans with other beings to say, well, you know, we'll time it so that it pans out like this. And eventually in this year, boom, and you'll get all that information. And then when your life is all, you had all those adventures. Now you've got a clear vision of what you need to do. And you're going to work in complete solitude, which is what it's been. So it's interesting you ask that question. I, 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 can, I can honestly say I don't know. I don't know if I manifested this, but I have to assume that I am that I am manifested this. And if I, if the essential meaning of I am that I am is I am, is there anybody else? If we each feel I am, maybe we're all the I am. Well, the reason I asked that, Alan, was because it it seems very similar to your Davy Jones story because you you know you express this this utter hatred for him as a young person <laughs> maybe not so much hatred but it's definitely jealousy you know like you want That's what he has you want to be in his position you want to be him and then you're forced to confront that and reconcile that later in your life and then now you have this shakespeare work that you spent so much time on but in your younger days as well, you had this terrible association with that name, Shakespeare, and this memory that you had with your bangers and your police encounters. So yep. it just seems like, yeah, there's something working here to to bring you back into reconciliation with this part of yourself. Uh, at least that's how yep. I have been reading it or listening to it unfold here this whole time. So I think that is probably a good segue then. We've done so much setup here in context. We we need to get into the actual Shakespeare mystery before it gets too late here. So you said that it started in 2004 when you went to L.A. to help your friend with his one-man show. But it really, it seems like based on your own timeline that, that this doesn't really kick into high gear until about 2010. Let's start there and let's go through as much as you want to go through of what you've uncovered and some of the key details here. I know that the visual aids are helpful and I will link to whatever I can uh, that you speak about so people can follow along if they like or just go on to research on their own, obviously. But let's start in 2010 with the real Da Vinci Code. By 2010, I had been on it for six years. And in those six years, I was discovering what I call poetical codes because they were hidden within text. There was nothing mathematical at this point. It was just the text. And the texts that I was examining were the text of the gravestone of Shakespeare, text of the monument of Shakespeare, and the text of the sonnet's dedication written by Shakespeare. And those texts spoke to me in a certain way, even though it is text. Yes, there is math involved just in this more clearly. There's just arithmetic involved, adding up the number of characters in the text. So to cut to the quick on that, I knew that, OK, I had an intuition. And of course, that intuition comes from meditating. It, it comes from being in tune with that blissful, peaceful feeling that tells you when you're on the right track or you don't feel it if you're on the wrong track. And so I could always use that as my guide. I would go into meditation. I would tune myself with that feeling that would tell me 
right, I'm in tune now. I know what is right and what's wrong if I encounter it. And I would look into what I was researching and know then intuitively, oh, yes, I do believe that this is part of the story. And on one level, it's very clear because Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the man from Stratford, is buried, supposedly, in the church, Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-on-Avon. And there are markers. There's a gravestone. But his name is not on that gravestone. The only name on that gravestone is Jesus. There's a monument that has a lot of some Latin and some English. And it is all, I'm I'm not going to go into it, but people can look on the website and see uh, what, what all this is. It's just, it makes no sense. It's clearly what cryptographers call cryptic. The spellings are, well, the spelling was problematic anyway in, that, in those days, but the spellings are so out there that I mean, we take the same word and spell it two or three different ways in order to nudge letters into a certain pattern. So the way they made codes in those days was in something called a Cardano grill. It meant you take this text and instead of reading it linearly, you will say, I, I know it's going to be put into a grid and say the first 17 letters will be there and then it will wrap around. It will start again for another 17 letters and it will wrap around and start again for another 17. And then you would look for a vertical message in that particular grid. So if you put it in the wrong grid, you're not going to see the vertical message. Right. And that's a well-known method called equidistant letter spacing or Cardano grill. And so I was already knowing and understanding from my research that a man named John D, who was the Queen's conjurer and the Queen's astrologer, the most brilliant mathematician at the time and the most brilliant encryptor. And above all, he was a spy and his code number was 007, for God's sake. <laughs> his, his number was 007, which was later used, obviously, for James Bond, because that's how James Bond came about. First spy on Her Majesty's Secret Service was John Dee. But John Dee had done many, 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 many things with cryptography. And I knew that to be looking for that. So to cut to the quick on that, the gravestone and the monument and the science dedication are all very mysterious texts. There have been books written about each of them saying, I think this is a code. But no one was able to completely crack it because they didn't understand that all three had to be hooked together. And when you add all three of them together, they add up to 624 characters. And it turns out that John D had something channeled to him. <laughs> and here it gets pretty deep. He had something channeled to him by angels. He was communing with angels for eight years of his life in the 1580s. And he kept it quiet because he could have been burned at the stake for such a heretical act. But he wrote it all in his diaries. And if you start looking him up, you'll find it everywhere. He's, he's well, it's well known. He communed with angels. And those angels dictated to him something called the Enochian Tables. And they dictated it to him on June 24th, 1584. June 24th, 624, which happens to be also the summer solstice when it was celebrated back then. It was celebrated on June 24th. Today, it's on June 21 to 22. Back then, because the calendars were out of whack and we were just switching over from the Julian to the Gregorian, it was still being, it was being celebrated on June 24th. That is the feast day of St. John the Baptist, patron saint of Freemasonry. And on 6 to for the angels dictated to John D a table of 624 squares <laughs> in a completely different language called Enochian that he had to learn over years. And then they dictated it in the English translation of it. And they give him all of this. And literally, it's, so it's it's given to him on 624, it's 624 squares, and I notice that the gravestone and the monument and the sonnet's dedication are 624 characters. It doesn't take a great leap of from that to say, oh, probably we're supposed to connect these in some way. I mean, come on, it's called 
cipher text and plain text. It's the most simple way of doing a code. Here's the, it's called the, cy the cipher text is what's visible. The gravestone, the monument, the sonnets, dedication. They point across to this plain text, which is in, in cryptography. That's what's going to reveal the true message. Ah, okay. So I put these 624 characters, point them at the 624 characters in the Enochian tables, and presumably it's going to tell me something. But I need to know the key, what letters in the ciphertext do point across to what letters in the Enochian tables. And that was quite simple because it was everywhere apparent that this name of God, <laughs> and now we get to that, that name. Shakespeare in Sonnet 121 says, I am that I am, and they that level at my abuses reckon up their own. In that time period, early 1600s, there was a law that said you cannot say the name of God. You cannot use the name of God. You cannot say I am that I am. You cannot say Jesus. You cannot say the Holy Trinity. You cannot say various names of God. He says it, but he doesn't just say it. He doesn't just use it. He uses it in the first person. He says, no, I am that I am. And they that level at my abuses reckon up their own. King James had issued an edict called the Act of Abuses, that if anybody used the name of God, they would be fined 10 pounds per infringement. It's about $10,000 per infringement, which for a thousand sonnets that published, we presume, would be about $10 million. But that would be the least of his worries because it's blasphemy. He should have been hung, drawn and quartered. But it's not only blasphemy, it's treasonous, because the next line he says, and they that level at my abuses, that's the name of the law that King James says you can't say that. He's saying, what's your own abuses, man? They that level at my abuses reckon up their own. So blasphemy and treason, he should have been, <laughs> there's no way he should have survived. But he says it there, that there, right, plain sight, Sonnet 121. Oh, okay. Well, what is the name of God? The I am that I am. What was the symbol that was used to convey that? It is known as the triple tau. I'm not a Freemason, so I can talk about it. Freemasons are not allowed to talk about these sacred oaths that are taken, but the name of God, that I am that I am, was depicted in what is called a triple tau, three T's joined together and that also look like a TH because there's three T's and then there's a T at the top and two T's at the bottom going side by side. Just Google it. You'll find it. It's easy, easier to see that way, but it's on my website as well. Triple Tau. And it means the name of God. It means I am that I am. And it's a way of hiding the name of God. And another way of hiding it, the abbreviation of that is just two T's, a double T. And so long story short, the double T's are placed in the Cipher text, they point across to the Enochian tables and they reveal a message. And that message says, living page, yo stigmata, I have hewn desiderata. Well, that's a Shakespearean sh <laughs> couplet. It says a living page. A page has been kept alive for posterity. Living. Yo stigmata. Yo does not mean what it means today. Yo. It's not part of a rap song. It's yo. <laughs> it meant in medieval times, look at, but really look at. It means it has this other meaning. Really, really pay attention. It doesn't mean just look at it. It means really look at. Yo, stigmata. Stigmata are Christ's wounds. That's all they are. Stig the stigmata are Christ's wounds. Two in the hands, two in the feet, the spear in the side. Where are Christ's wounds in any church? They're on the Holy of Holies altar stone. That's where they are. They are incised onto an altar stone, five crosses that represent Christ's stigmata wounds. And they are cut into that stone in order to consecrate that stone so that you can say mass at that stone, so that you can commune for Catholics and Catholics commune with the divine at that holy of holies altar stone. So it's saying there's a living page. I've left something for you. Look. Really look at the stigmata wounds. Oh, oh, look at the holy altar. I have hewn. Hewn means cut into stone. It has all, that's what it means. Where I have cut into stone, desiderata is Latin for what my desires, what I want you to know. I've left a page or something announcing, whatever it is, living page. I've left it alive. It could be pages. It could be a page. It could be whatever. We don't know. But it's, I've left something. It's there. 
Look at the stigmata wounds in the Holy of Holies of the stone where I have cut into stone, cut into that stone, what I want you to know. Absolutely clear as a bell, dead simple. So I knew it was in the Holy of Holies altar stone, which is 10 feet away from Shakespeare's grave in Holy Trinity Church. Well, they're not going to let me in. Well, let me come in and just say, okay, <laughs> I'd like to open your altar, please. It's the most visited tourist attraction in Europe, in, in England, besides Tower of London. You know, they have four million people a year visit that church, uh, j just that church alone, to see the gravestone and the monument that are right next to this altar stone, staring us in the face. And it should have five consecrated crosses on the cover, but it, on the surface, but it doesn't because they've been cut off during the Reformation. And you realize, wait a minute, this has been tampered with. And there's a cross on the side that shouldn't be there. And I look at the cross on the side. Anyway, I cultivated the church for four years, six visits to the church, helping them with various things. I created a calendar for them to sell in their gift shop to raise money. I, we talked about doing a Davy Jones concert to raise money there. But unfortunately, he passed before that could happen. But they, they got to like me and trust me and give me access. And so I was able to give a presentation there on Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd, doing the excerpts from my musical about Shakespeare. And at the dress rehearsal for that, I put up a huge banner advertising the musical, 12 foot by 9 foot, in front of the altar so that nobody could see the altar. And then I had the piano playing my songs, and for the last number I said, let's turn the lights down and do this last night by candlelight so that it would be so emotive and beautiful. And I'm singing Sonnet 18, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? This is all on the website, you can check it out and we can see. And I'm doing that with all the lights off, because we had to turn the lights off to defeat the CCTV cameras so that nobody could see what we were doing behind the banner, which was we were radar scanning the altar. Song finishes, applause, applause, applause. We've got it, we leave, and we've got it. We've got the scientific proof. And if you look online, you'll see that there's a, I mean, there should be a tiny, tiny hole in that altar stone because that's what a consecrated altar stone has to have. It has to have what's called a saint's cavity with relics of a saint, and it should be about the size of a little child's shoebox. The hole in that altar is 250 times that size. And the scan shows differing levels of density showing that there's something in there. Exactly what the, co what the codes predicted. I have left a living page, something inside for you to tell you what's going on here. Inside that altar stone and I scan it and there it is. But it's not a tiny thing. It is huge. It could house all of the missing manuscripts, all the greatest works of literature. It could house an entirely new, unknown masterpiece by Shakespeare. And so my job was to then say, all right, I want to get that altar stone opened. And you think, well, that's simple enough. I've worked on this for six years. I found the code. I know it's in the altar. I go there, I scan it, and I've got scientific proof but they don't want that proof because it threatens a multi-billion dollar tourism industry. And so what do I do? I, for, for the time being, I kept it under wraps because I had to figure out a strategy. And I didn't know that that under wraps meant I would have to work for another six years getting the other side of this, which is that there are mathematical codes. And for those, you just need to go to Bard code, B A R D C O D E. Bard code. Just Google Bard code and, and I name Alan Green, and you'll be taken to a YouTube video that's only 13 minutes long and it shows the cover of the sonnets. And on the cover of the sonnets, as I'm sure you've seen, Ryan, there's all this geometry. And that geometry is undeniable math. So it's no longer in the realm of, oh, when you think stigmata means the holy altar. I mean, you can. You can come up with any kind of argument to say, I don't want to open that altar because it's a holy relic. Uh, and you just think that, Alan, and we don't think that, so we're not going to open it. But if you've got mathematics as well that says, oh, look at that. There's pure, perfect geometry outlining 12 of the most significant mathematical constants that we know of. Pi and phi and E and E minus one and the Euler-Mascheroni constant. And not to mention the speed of light. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's monstrous. And the coup de grace of all of that is, as I, as I revealed at a CPAC conference, a scientific conference, just two years ago, is that it gives you also the precise geographic coordinates of the Great Pyramid of Giza, 
And then I had to then start investigating that. Why is he pointing us to Giza? Because the same 12 constants are in the Great Pyramid that are in the cover of the sonnets. He's telling us something absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Now, what it means, that's for us to find out. And the only way we can find out is to open that altar. And so I have a voting mechanism on the website that just simply says, you know, go to the website and go to the vote tab and, and simply vote. Yes, I want to know what Shakespeare left for posterity or no, I'm not interested. Let's leave it another 400 years. So far, it's not viral because I've only just started to promote this. But we've got 12,000 votes saying, yes, open it. And about 200 maybe saying no, because typically you're going to get that. You know, you're going to get 1% or 2% of people saying, no, I don't want to know. But the vast majority of the world is going to say, yeah. I mean, if I said to you today, hey, I know for sure that behind this rock, there's a new Mona Lisa. Should we have a look? Nah, let's not bother. I know for sure that in this uh, in this uh, cellar here, there's Beethoven's 10th. Should we have a look? Nah. I mean, I mean the world would beat a path to say, well, yeah, <laughs> just open it. But with this story, because it is resisted because of financial benefit to those who want to not rock the boat, it is strongly resisted. And so the strategy that I have at this moment is to get a million votes so that it becomes a story. And so that we can have Oprah there with a microphone in their face saying, do you know a million people voted to open your altar? What do you think about that? We need a story. I mean, it's OK for thousands of people to know, but that's not a story. It needs to be big, and it will be in time as the votes accrue. But that's the main thrust of what I'm doing is to say, look, he's, he's, he's far more than what we think. He's not this stuffy, you know, what we started out talking about. Oh, the language is difficult. Shakespeare, and I don't know. God, I don't know if I want to know about that. You do. Because it's, it's an amazing story, and he's far more than he, he let on. He's there telling us that he's, first of all, he's telling us, I am that I am, which is a frightening proposition, because what does he mean by that? He's telling us he's in, he's, he's sometimes, he's, I think he's telling us he's enlightened. He know he's in a high state of consciousness. But he's also telling us, I, I'm a stupendous mathematician, and you never knew that. And I also know some math constants that they didn't know then. I mean, he's put mountains that weren't discovered until 100, 200, 300 years later by Newton and Miller and others. I mean, it's, it's crazy. What does that mean? It means, oh, yeah, that old story of what are the Freemasons protecting? What, are, what were the Rosicrucians protecting? They were protecting ancient wisdom passed down through initiatory societies and hidden from the general populace because it was dangerous because the church didn't want you to know that there were more things in heaven and earth a ratio than I dreamt of in your philosophy, as Hamlet says. It's big, it's important, it may well be scientifically. There's, there's something in Walter, the poet, because he's gone to great lengths to give us all these poetic Tell. I mean, the car, there are many, many codes. I've only just described one to you. It could be the manuscript, it could be a new masterpiece, but there's also, he spent just as much time giving us mathematical codes that show he had a mathematical and scientific knowledge hundreds of years ahead of his time. So, what is in there that's telling us about the pyramid, that's telling us about stuff that was known in the past and we don't know now? It could beneficial to us scientifically there's no reason not to open an altar stone it's got to be opened ultimately because the pressure that will come to be too great i think the church will just simply have to open it if enough people demand that so a couple things about that the first thing is you run the risk of having a geraldo rivera al capone's vault type of moment with that they could clean that thing out before you even got to it and be like, hey, guess what? Nothing here. Sorry about your luck. Yeah, you voted to have this open, yeah. but you know what? There's actually nothing here. So that might be a little bit conspiratorial on, on my part to think that way. But, you know, I mean, if they really wanted to keep it hidden, then they would just clean it out themselves. I mean, I find it hard to believe that the people who work there and take care of that site and curate it, that they don't already know that there's something there. 
But I guess if they haven't looked, why would they know, right? You're absolutely you're absolutely right. You're asking all the right questions, Ryan. Perfect. So let me address that very quickly. The Geraldo moment, for those who don't know, is uh, when Geraldo, the TV personality, was going to open up Al Capone's vault, and it turned out to be a big bust. And but he'd promoted it in advance, and the TV cameras are there, and oh, oh we're going to open it tonight, and it was a bust. Nothing there. And obviously, yes, that's a concern to any uh, media who are going to get behind this. What if there's another Geraldo moment? So you need to understand a little bit of the history. That altar stone was actually hidden, taken from its position years before John D. and the real Shakespeare, whoever he was, or the Stratford man, if it was him. I, I keep on liking, I like to say that because I don't want to, uh, I, I, I believe the way to the, into the hearts of the Stratford people is not to be adversarial, but to just try to <laughs> offer some possibility that maybe it still is their man. And you know what? There is a slim possibility of that. I personally don't believe it, but there is a slim possibility that he was just hiding it for some other reason that we don't yet know. To me, that's not likely, but so I still I, I try to just stay publicly neutral in my expressions of that because it's the best way to get things done. I've found I've 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 been able to get access simply by helping them. But in the helping of them, I you need to know that 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 altar stone was taken down during the Reformation. King Henry the eighth. They took it down, the monks took it down and hid it underground in the catacombs of the church because all of a sudden we weren't Catholic, we were going to be Protestant. And then they were doing the ransacking of all of the, all of the churches and the monasteries. And so you can see that the, the stigmata wounds crosses on the surface of that Holy of Holies altar stone have been hacked off. And so therefore it's already been desecrated. It was taken down below to protect it from further damage. And there it stayed for 60 years. But John Dee had access to that church. He knew the people that owned basically Warwickshire. And he, he certainly had access and he certainly was able to do what he had to do to complete the perfection of this masterpiece of encoding, which involved putting something in that altar stone. But he didn't just then let it surface. He buried it underground in a place where there's another code. So, I mean, this takes a bit of, you know, your question is perfectly valid, but there's another tomb somewhere where they buried that alt stone with a code on it telling you it's under here because they wanted to protect it. But it was only inches, inches beneath the soil. And it was found in 1889. So that altar stone was brought up in 89 and immediately put back in place as the Holy of Holies altar stone. I therefore decided I would film it. You can't just take it out. You can't just examine what's in it because it's cemented into the back wall of the church and into the ground. So I filmed every square inch of it. If they change anything, if they go in and change it, it will be known and they will be busted for having done that. And I've already alerted them that that cannot happen because that would be the worst kind of publicity they could possibly get. In other words, we would know. I will be posting online all these pictures of what the altar stone looks like in its condition when I filmed it. If it's the slightest bit different, we would know if they'd done something. We would also be able to know forensically if it had been opened with modern tools versus tools that were used 400 years ago. And we would also simply know that if the scan itself shows that something is in there, that when it was found in 1889, if they'd have looked at it then, they'd have taken that stuff out. And they never would have put it back in its fragile state. They would have filled in that hole because it wouldn't be able to support itself. They'd have filled it in with concrete. Therefore, the scan would not have revealed any cavity at all. So I am absolutely confident that what is there, has been put there, is still there. Your question on whether they would do the deed is is well taken but i have a person in the church an associate who works there 
who's watching that all the time and will inform me if there's even a whiff of that about to happen. And it's such it would be such a complicated procedure. They won't be they won't they won't do that until they feel the heat. They just won't do it. It would require shutting down the church, pulling the altar out. I mean, there's just no way. You'd have to understand how it's structured. It's literally cemented into the wall, into the floor, into the structure. They can't just get it. They can suspect, and they they no doubt do, but they can't just do it. And somebody will inform me if there's a whiff that they're going to do that. And if that, in that case, I will then go and chain myself to the bleeding thing. And and, and and cause an outrageous event. Yeah. I don't know. I will. I'll go to prison for it. I, d- I don't care. I mean, we risked imprisonment d- d- scanning the altar. I mean, you know, we yeah. could have been arrested and then prison for just doing that. We, yeah, we, but we knew it was important to do it. But no, that that that's not that's not on the cards. But if it was, I have a strategy in place to deal with it. Somebody's going to tell me if that's about to happen. And so far, there's not even a whiff of it. I just believe that by getting the votes, we're going to get the attention on it in time. And once that attention is there, the whole world will be looking at it. So they're not going to make a move then. That's fair, man. That's completely fair. Hey, so thank you so much for taking as much time as you did here today. Before we go, then tell people where they can keep up with you and your work and then when they can look out for the next books that are going to be out. I know you're starting a Patreon campaign soon as well to support your work. So give people all the, the pertinent information yeah. that they need to, to keep up with you as you move forward here. Thanks, Ryan. Well, first of all, it's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, you're, you're very, very in tune with this, well-versed and asked all the right, perfect questions. And obviously you were doing your side of the thing perfectly because you're absolutely into it and you know my work and that, that's always appreciated. So you're doing a great job and I'm, I, I very much appreciate that. At the moment, the best place to go is to the website because that's the, the central place for all my work. That will be expanding and we'll have somebody working on a, a more complex website because uh, what I've got is, is fairly simple at this moment. But that is, as you know, www.tobe or not to be. No numbers. Dot org is where you can find everything. And uh, aside from that, there are links within there to the YouTube setups where there's a lot of stuff. And that will be moving to, well, not moving. I will be keeping that, but also doing a Patreon site. You know, the ultimate goal of this is, I mean, I've, I've worked literally, I, <laughs> I think I said earlier on, you know, I just sort of volunteered for the job but you know if you if you knew in advance i think this is the same for all of us you know if we knew in advance what was facing us we might not take the first step into something that might be a new tack for us i just went because oh yeah my friend i'll come and support him oh it's a great story i think i'll write a musical oh no it seems to be more like a da vinci code oh i'll look for the real codes oh i found the real codes oh i mean it just went on and on you sort of led along a path and all of a sudden you're looking back and going boy nearly 15 years during that time i kind of stopped work i literally (laughs) stopped work thinking oh i'll just do this and i spent my entire life savings (laughs) on this and the entire time doing it was just but that doesn't matter it's a joy and a privilege to be doing it but you end up realizing wow, you know, yeah, now I'm, I'm ready with, I don't think one will ever have the entire depth of the entire story, because what I see in this is that the more I un- uncover, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. I probably could finish another six books right now. It just is endless because it's done by an avatar. It's done by someone is who is in divine consciousness. It's done by someone with a mission to absolutely bring this message of alchemy to the world in a beautiful, beautiful way that tells you poetry and math. They're both tremendously important right brain and left brain balancing those two he's shown it in in a metaphor he's shown it in the work itself and so i will be putting out a patreon site and the main thrust is just simply to get that altar open so if people want to help the best thing that they can possibly do is is please just go to the website and vote 
and tell your friends to do the same thing because only by virality of numbers are we going to get the attention. Once that attention takes over, then it's mathematically inevitable. It's like Euler's number E, exponential growth. It will come about that there will be millions of votes and then ultimately tens of millions because there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of Shakespeare fans all over the world who would love to know what their guy left for them. Wouldn't we want to know? I mean, jeez, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> it's like, he tells us, I've left something. I've told you where. And I've gone and scanned it, and I've got the actual scans to prove it. It's sitting there. We just have to get past this resistance that they don't want to lose their tourism industry. And the irony of that is actually their tourism industry will actually increase. I mean, it will, it will go through the roof. <laughs> Once the, it will go through the roof. Absolutely. Once the story comes out that there's actually something there, that the man actually did leave us something where we thought before there was a complete vacuum. Alan, I can only speak for myself, obviously, but I have to say that I admire your work here. It is both intellectually stimulating and artistically and creatively inspiring. I, I really enjoy this material, and I look forward to seeing you know what sort of mystery unravels henceforth with your work here. Me so <laughs> I do appreciate, like I said, I, I do appreciate your time and taking as much as you did here. I know you're busy with this project, so I wish you nothing but right. the best of luck with it, and hopefully we can talk again about it soon. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with your your great family of listeners, and I, I look forward. Please tell them. Please contact me if you have any questions at all. I will certainly answer them all in good time because that's what I've signed up for. All right. Take care of yourself, Alan. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ryan. It's a great pleasure. <laughs> Pencil. And there you have it. My thanks again to Alan Green. As I said up front, a bit of a different chat than I've heard from him before. I did not expect to go that far into his personal life and his background, but I'm glad we did. It gave a lot more context to his work and his journey and how he ended up where he is. Very synchronistic or karmic, however you want to look at it. I thought the opening chunk there about manifesting intentions was quite cool and a good reminder that there is something to having a positive mindset and focusing on what it is you want out of your experience here. You really can make anything happen if you want it to, or will it to. And of course, the Shakespeare mystery, that is something that words just do not, cannot do justice. You really do need to see Alan's videos and presentations to believe his work. The connections he makes are literally jaw-dropping. Makes you wonder just what the hell is actually going on there, or what's been going on there, and what it all means. But this whole story is just really good brain food. All the mathematical intricacies and the identity mystery. I think what Alan says makes a lot of sense, especially when you see him lay it out on screen. Although I have thought that John D. being the person responsible here was, or is, a bit too convenient, but who knows. I've also seen credible theories for others, including Edward de Vere, who was mentioned here, and also for Mary Sidney, who wasn't mentioned here. Mary, of course, is a woman, and that theory has always lurked in the background of the Shakespeare authorship mystery, and I think it deserves more attention. It wouldn't be the first time a group of men have laid claim to something that isn't theirs, or the first time they did so at the expense of a woman. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, another 45-ish minutes with Alan, in which we talked more about the mathematical constants found on the cover of Shakespeare's sonnets, and their connection to mystery schools, secret societies, and that prolific John Dee. Talked a bit about Thales, who was Pythagoras' mentor, and whom the Thales theorem is named after, and how that theorem connects to the Great Pyramid in Egypt, Touched on some yet-to-be-published work from Alan, including his work on the world's first crossword puzzle, which, as you might guess, connects to the Shakespeare mystery, as well as the Anakian table constructed by Dee and Edward Kelly. Also talked about how Alan's background in music prepared him to comprehend the mathematics involved in his research. Thought that was a pretty cool angle into this. Then we touched on more about the Rosicrucian connection to this story. And then, finally, we ask the most important question, not who was Shakespeare, but what was Shakespeare? And I think you would dig Alan's answer. I know I did. Good stuff, if I may say. And a few new patrons enjoyed that extension, so shoutouts to Setkin, India, Alita, 
and former guest John Laban for hopping on board the Esoteric Endeavor recently. Hope I pronounced all your names correctly. If not, my apologies. And a quick shout out to Apple user AMC Drinks Wine, who left a five star review recently that said, Smart host, incredible shows, great vocabulary, voice, and topics have been binge listening, and they're all great. I feel smarter after each episode. Thanks for that review, AMC Drinks Wine. Much appreciated, and I am thrilled that you're getting something from this thing. Also, a quick note that if you are a patron already and you've been reading Snow Crash for our Compendium Book Club this month, don't forget our discussion is on Sunday, September 30th, this Sunday, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. GMT. We'll be doing that over Zoom, so stay tuned to the Patreon page for more information on that this weekend. But anyway, I am out of time for this time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture... I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.